Th thank you for that introduction. Uh, th uh, thank you, Stefan, and thank you for your warm welcome. Um, what you have this evening is, is a, uh, a partnership between a marketing person and an engineer. Um, uh, and, and that's probably very, very rare. Um, uh, uh, and what we'd like to do is to have this as a conversation, if we could. So if you'd like to make a comment or a question as we go through, um, feel free to do so, um, because this is about you and not us. Um, uh, but the reason I wanted to start by saying it's about marketing and an engineer is because of this strange word, cloud computing. I don't know what your view of cloud computing is, but it seems to be one of those things that can be all-purpose to anyone. Uh, people define it in different ways. Um, uh, it means uh, it's being developed in different ways. People, are, big companies are investing in it in different ways. Um, and our proposition tonight is that we should engineer, and I choose that word very, very carefully. I think engineering is one of the most wonderful skills that we as a nation have had for 300 years, and it ought to be valued much more uh, by our society today. And I'm, our, our proposition this evening is that we should engineer um, the, um, the, the propositions around cloud. I have a friend, uh, Ian Hunter, who's the global uh, marketing uh, principal for Fujitsu, who's trying to do exactly that. Uh, I'm convinced he's looked more haggard and grey as, as his time goes time he, uh, go by. He's, he's got that responsibility on a global level, and I'm sure he won't mind me telling you that he spends a lot of time on aeroplanes and a lot of time with people trying to think this thing through. So really this, after, this evening is about marketing and engineering working together to create a very precise proposition to customers. That's, that's really all. Should we go home now? That's what we want to say. OK. Um, but, ju but just a couple of things about uh, marketing and engineering. Uh, one of my heroes is a man called Josiah Wedgwood. He lived in the 1700s, and he created that fabulous pottery brand, Wedgwood. Um, uh, he started dirt poor with nothing at all. Um, and he ended up a multi-millionaire um, and creating a business and a brand that's uh, known around the world and, and uh, uh, lasted for 300 years. And people said to him, what is it you do um, to make this successful? He was a marketing person to his core. Uh, and he said marketing, uh, as we would call it today, he defined it as the science of money getting. The science of money getting. So I respect science. On the other hand, a hundred years later, uh, Rothschild, the banker, uh, was asked to invest in several um, Victorian engineering projects. And in exasperation, he said, there are three ways to lose money. Drink, women, and engineers. <laughs> of the three, the two uh, are, are, are first are the most pleasant and the third is the most certain. Uh, so um, w we, need, we need to define these, th these, these things through. So that's our thesis. And my, my opening few slides, really, the first 10 minutes of this, um, is about really context. Uh, and the proposition that is, is that service and things built on service can be carefully engineered and looking at some of the macro forces that make that happen. That's really the context that Tony's asked me to go through. Then he's going to do the clever stuff, aren't you? You're going to go through the precision stuff, uh, and, then, and then we'll wrap up at the end. And as I say, please uh, feel free to make comments and questions as we go through. So just starting, the thing we're going to talk about has various names, and I'm not going to give you these academic definitions but some academics call it this dreadful, it sounds like an American word, servitization, you know, really stretching the English language. Some uh, academics, there's an academic at Cambridge who studies this field who calls it manu services. What they're trying to say is that manufacturing these days is rarely just about producing a widget and making money out of selling that product. It's normally associated with some form of service uh, and service component. And uh, we have about a 20, 25 year history of product manufacturing companies and service software companies trying to uh, build um, service um, uh, offers around their, um, around their offer. Um, so, th so if you want to dig into this and look at some of the academic study of it, 
Um, this is how they would define it. And uh, if you really want to uh, base your policy and your business uh, strategy around something credible, I would recommend to you Professor Andy Neely, uh, who's, at, who's at Cambridge University, who studied this quite extensively. But uh, let me t put it a different way and tell it as a story. For most companies, uh, product companies, um, it starts like this. You have a product, this represents a product sold for a price with that lovely, wonderful thing called margin. And in there somewhere, represented by the green star, is service. Um, some years ago, I, I was recruited to be the uh, services marketing director of Unisys, the American computer company. Um, and when I uh, got there, um, about a year before that, um, the margin on the main product they sold, the computer mainframe, was a thousand percent. Just, just take that in a moment. A thousand percent margin. You can do anything with a thousand percent margin. You can be very sloppy in your processes. Um, you can, you can uh, have you know, really good training courses for everyone. You can have an annual party, sorry, sales conference. Um, yeah, you can do many, many things when you've got a thousand percent margin. Now, four years, uh, is it following me okay, this machine? Am I, am I moving around too much or is, is that okay? Uh, this, this thing apparently is some clever iPhone that's recording our session and following us around. Am I around, moving around too much? Okay. Okay. All right. So um, the the um, I have about three or four years after I um, uh, uh, joined Unisys, the margin, this margin, dropped dramatically to virtually zero. So this was the effect. Suddenly, like that. Um, and and this has happened to company after company after company. Famously, IBM faced this crisis in 1994. GE faced it in about 1997. The great electronics company in Holland, Philips, uh, is, uh, who are in healthcare and uh, consumer products, are going through it right now. Ericsson, the, uh, the big telecommunications manufacturer, went through that evolution around the turn of the century. Company after company has been through this crisis. And, and it exposes this issue of service. Um, now, what happens in, that, uh, in those circumstances is the board, people at the top, says, what are we going to do? Can we reduce costs so that we improve our margin? Do we need, some clever people say, do we need to invest in new machinery? Should we try and um, invest to, to become more efficient? We'll plant out in the system so that we can improve our, uh, our performance in that way. Uh, can we push costs down to our suppliers? Japanese companies seem to be really, really good at doing that. They call it just in time, and it's very, very painful if you're a supplier to them. Uh, but somewhere along the line, uh, line, people say, well, what about this thing called service? We have all these engineers. Uh, all this support system repairing things and replacing things and uh, doing uh, software drops and all of those sort of things. Can we use that skill in... in uh, in some way that our customers might value. Can, can we do that? And, and some people say, well, can we productize our service? Which is really Tony's area of expertise. And that's where people begin to explore this journey into service that gives us the background as to why cloud-based services could be so powerful uh, as a proposition. Some companies move to the left. They say, we, we can't do that, we don't have expertise for that, we will remain an efficient uh, product manufacturing company. Uh, that's that's um, a sensible strategy, it's the heart of their business and there are companies in the world who've survived and thrived by doing just that. For instance, they'll, uh, they'll move to other parts of the world, uh, they'll open factories, say in China, uh, and their aim is to improve their margin by just remaining a manufacturing company. Often those sort of companies will outsource software support and services to other companies that specialize in, in that area. But others have gone in this direction. They begin to create a proposition out of services. And I say the primary example on this uh, is, is IBM, Hewlett Packard and others in, in the computer industry. Um, and they begin to say, you know, can we sell our product through a service 
experience, a, a margin. Some even go so far as to say, lose the product altogether and they become just a service provider. So they may move into training and consultancy uh, uh, and, and other forms of services and drop the product. Um, yeah, some, some, there are companies that, that went uh, th th completely this way. So Logica, for example, uh, was originally manufacturing uh, products and tried to move almost completely to services. Um, and and the, the logic is, you know, um, customer infrastructure, particularly big companies, is so complex that they can make money out of providing, you know, um, advice, consultancy, training. And there's a better margin on that from the, for them than than actually producing the product itself. Yes. What, why do you think they're a good example? Yes. Yeah. So so for the for the uh, camera, the the uh, s suggestion is that Fujitsu moved used to manufacture mainframe computers and is now. Well, they, they do desktop services, don't they, for large organisations and things and things like that. So, so yeah, that, that, that's certainly been their strategy for, what would you say, 10 years, 15 years? Yes. And the logic is that there's people are prepared to um, to pay for this this service, um, and and often there's more of a margin uh, in the service expertise than than there is in the products. Now, here's a warning. Um, when I became, uh, when I joined Unisys, and I, I remember this, I'm sure he won't mind me telling you. On the day that I joined, you know, you know what it's like in a new job, you're finding your feet. And I literally got into my office after, after meeting a few people around about 11 o'clock in the morning. And the director of operations came in, Charlie, and he said to me this, he said, you're the new marketing guy. I said, yeah. And he said, well, pleased to meet you. And we introduced ourselves. He said, we've got this brand new service we're about to launch. We know the customers want it. That wasn't true. They hadn't asked anyone. Uh, it's ready to go. That certainly wasn't true. All we had was a leaflet. That's it. They have literally made it up. Um, and we know they'll pay for it, which turned out to be completely untrue. Um, so that service should have had about another nine, ten months of detailed design. And I would suggest to you there is absolutely no way that you would launch a product or a piece of software onto the marketplace if it's not been properly engineered. You know, if, if wires were still falling out the back of it or if it, if it, or if it wasn't pro properly tested. Company after company, particularly with cloud services, tends to, sorry. I've got to disagree. I launched, okay. launched a product on Sunday and uh, the, the presentation, the, one of the two parts of it didn't work. Oh, so you launched a product that wasn't ready for, for the customers? Well, the, 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 de the demonstration wasn't working properly. Oh, right. Okay. But, but, well, the the but, but the product that you were selling them actually worked? It, it, it existed? Um, yes. Okay. <laughs> the, the hardware part. Right. And uh, making sure all the, the software would actually sort of connect up and all the instructions. We've been uh, sorting out and just finished today. So you've been retrofitting? Yeah. Very trusting customers. Very trusting customers. I wouldn't well, give, give the customers what they want. <laughs> right, okay. I, 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 well, um, it is a common uh, experience when people are producing services to just make, create a leaflet and say, this is what we can do for you. And there's, uh, I, behind your product, I would have thought there was some design of the physical thing that somebody had actually sat down and worked through yeah. you know what the tolerances were how it should perform well, you know that, no, <laughs> but but there was a bit of bit of engineering was there yeah. yeah and and the software you know you tested it a little before it went out yeah, yeah. you know um, you know so so something existed well no it was, it, it was only the, the person doing it uh, no, I wouldn't say it was properly tested no. but you but it, it existed Okay. Might have been Heath Robinson. Yeah. Sorry? Might have been a Heath Robinson. A Heath Robinson thing, but something was there. Yes. In our situation, 
we just had a brochure, that was it. There was nothing there at all. Um, so a, a, our proposition this evening is we ought to think a little bit about an engineer, the service proposition, before it's launched to, to market. And I'm going to hand over to my... Uh, a simple question. How yeah. do you sell a product that doesn't exist? I mean, at, at that point, you're in a legal problem, not, a, not anything else. If you're selling a, a leaflet, yeah. then you're, you're screwed. As yeah. soon as the customer gets you, they'll sue the Well, well you. I would argue that's true, that you've got, you've got nothing behind... You're making a claim that you don't have. Fraud. Yeah, well... I don't know whether it's criminal it's fraud, but, but it, it's... It's certainly civil fraud. It, it right. It certainly gets sued. You're making a claim that, it, it, you know, that has no substance behind it, aren't you? And that's been extended, say, when St Albans Council sued whoever their software supplier was a few years ago. So right. there's been quite a lot of case yes. law that's moved yes. on that and saying, well, actually, yes. you do have to yes. change your claims up, you just can't write a contract. Yes. And put a whole bunch of disclaimers in saying we're not yes. responsible for any of this because it won't hold up. So, so if you're if you're launching a product that's not tested and is a bit Heath Robinson, you ought to say so. Then, well, yeah. you've got, yes, you oh, may yeah. have some issues. Yeah, oh, yeah. I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah that made that clear. Yeah. yeah. But if yours is a service, you're yes. saying, oh, we didn't manufacture the IBM, but yeah. we're going to service it for you. Yes. That's okay because that exists. That piece of equipment exists, and you're just providing a service. Yes. Yes, yes, so, but, but you've got the engineering, you're okay there, you're very... Yeah, that's what you see. <laughs> yeah, yes. Is that what <laughs> <laughs> That's the product. Yeah, yes, yes, exactly. So, but, but you've got the yes. diagnostic skills, you've got the people trained, you've got the infrastructure in place to do that. You're making a claim that's reality. We had literally just made this service up. It was just something in somebody's idea that they were, that they were trying out. And... and we, our proposition is we need to be careful of doing that with this thing called cloud computing. Um, unless there's any more comments, I'm going to hand over to Tony to talk about some of the detail behind how you do this. And I've got to give you this. I'm told this is a dongle. Oh, I don't know. All right. Vaporware. Yes. Um, I've probably sold some of that. Um. Right, good evening everybody. Um, let's move on. Right, okay. What we wanted to talk about was some of the practicalities of what we've been talking about tonight. How do you now move to this servitization model? And we're not talking about services that just sort of stand on their own. Servitization is about you take your products and you take your services and it's how you take that whole proposition to the marketplace. And hopefully as I go through some of the slides, you'll see what I mean about some companies that actually are selling their products as a service, but you wouldn't know that they were doing it. Or maybe you would. Um, so the first thing we wanted to look at was, well, why move into offering services anyway? You've got a nice product, you've got your product going, you've got your nice software product, on the, sh on the shelf, why would you move to services? Well, there is actually quite a, a number of reasons. One is th the simple fact is the fact that if you're moving a tin box, a software program, that's actually quite easily replicable now in this day and age. You know, there's a lot of things, you know, that you see, a lot of people can easily replicate. You see that by, I think there's some ridiculous amount of apps on the App Store for these iPads of which about 2% are ever used. You know, there's people creating apps on these all the time. So how do you differentiate yourself? And you can use um, services to basically increase your income, increase your revenue. If you're just selling the product and you're just selling the software program or the product, the piece of tin, then that's your revenue stream. Once you've sold that product, that's it. So if you need a million pounds a year to keep the lights on in your factory and keep your production line going, then after you've sold your million pounds worth on the 31st of December, when you start again on the 1st of January, the clock's reset. You've got to find another million pounds worth of hardware sales, product sales, to then keep the thing keep rolling. What we're talking about tonight is, is there a way that you can start introducing service portfolio around that? And there are different degrees of service there's different positions of service you can do so hopefully we can talk about some of those um, what it does do is 
with services, it does allow you to differentiate yourself. You can differentiate yourself on service. Service is intangible. Service is the human being element of it. It puts up problems if you're a large company because you've got to get a lot of processes in place. You've got to try and make it real, as Laurie said, not a leaflet. But it is a way you can differentiate yourself. You know, any of you guys out there are selling yourself as consultants with a programme. You know, you've got the programme, but you're selling yourself as consultants. You're the differentiator out there. You know, the one thing that can't be replicated by anybody else. Well, it's unless you've got a course, I suppose. Um, so you can do a lot of things with it. It also um, allows you to differentiate yourself from competitors, and it allows you to smooth out your revenue streams as well, because you can get an annual, you can get sort of a monthly revenue streams coming from services. So you can get more money coming in than just waiting for that one product sale. So that's a lot of reasons why we, we look at, see what we can do about it. So there's lots of different reasons why you would do it. So first of all, let's have a look at this um, to just try and see if we can sort of put some context around it. Um, basically, Laurie, for some of his books, has done a lot of um, research and has basically come up with this very simple model which sort of illustrates the point. Basically, most companies, will see, or a lot of companies, can see themselves as this. Basically, you have a technical infrastructure. So this is your, basically your foundation technology. So that's what you've got as your foundation technology. You then have some core services on top of that. That's the prime thing that you're offering to your customer. And then you add added value services on top of that to create your differentiation. That's how you build your product up. So to give you an example, if we put BT up there. So British Telecom, technical infrastructure is their copper and now fibre in the ground. That's what their infrastructure is. That's what BT's got. Yeah, they've got and they've got fleets of men in vans. That's their core infrastructure. That's what they've got as technical infrastructure. Their core service they then run on top of that is telecommunications. They basically run telecommunications services over that physical infrastructure. So that's what they do. And it's important that they know what business they're in because that helps you decide who your competitors are. It decides all sorts of things. If you've got to understand value, the whole technical infrastructure of course. service. If you don't value that, then you will struggle moving into added value services. And then they start adding added value services. So they'll add broadband, LLU, etc. Sorry, local loop unbundling, use the terminology. Sorry, that's how they unbundle exchanges and let Sky put in their, their broadband propositions and that sort of thing. They'll put call minutes over it, voice over IP. They're doing on-demand TV, all sent over that technical infrastructure. That technical infrastructure is very old. Some of it's copper, some of it's even aluminium that was put in before the war. You know, so it's very old stuff. When you go around BT exchanges, and I don't know if any of you are BT here, but there's some stuff in BT exchanges that's still running that nobody knows why, nobody dares turn off because nobody knows what it does. And it's just <laughs> clicky clacking away in the corner. And it's just an amazing place. So there's a lot of that. But it's not just BT. I, I, just to sort of expand it out a bit, a different way of thinking about it. I've been working recently on a project and it's involved airlines and one of them is Cathay Pacific. And Cathay Pacific fits this model as well. So Cathay Pacific, for example, technical infrastructure is their network of landing slots. That's what an airline's got. An airline has, its technical infrastructure is the airline's, the slots, because otherwise without them they don't go anywhere. And they have the steel tubes that fly through the air. Their core service is their transportation. They're physically transporting people around. They're then adding added value services onto that. Now, there's the obvious ones, a first class, a meal on, you know, a seat and all that sort of thing. They're the obvious services. But what they're also doing is they're starting to give these iPads to the pilots. So when you used to see pilots walking through the airports with their big old flight bags, you know, those great big... They were basically full of maps of where they were going, you know, airport maps. When you land um, the, the actual airport, they follow basically a line on the runway and they have maps of all that. They have to do a lot of flight and weight balances. So when they do um, takeoffs pre-check, they have to do a lot of calculations that all used to be manual. It all then had to be um, uploaded, phone through, etc. What they're now doing is putting iPads on there. So we've now got a hardware product. 
They're now wrapping services around it, so they're putting software applications on it, and they're giving it connectivity. So the connectivity will be when it's in the airport, it connects Wi-Fi wirelessly to the airport infrastructure and then onwards to the airline's own data centres and infrastructure. And when it's in the air, it's using SATCOM or it's using Iridium networks or it's using VHF to um, communicate. So it's constantly in communication. What this does is it speeds up the whole method of getting the planes on board. They can, they can dispatch planes quicker, they can save fuel if they need to reroute, they can do things so they can instantly say if they need to reroute for a passenger emergency, they can put the meals and advance planning and all sorts of things. So they're wrapping the three things together. So that sort of way of thinking about how it is, what have you got, what's your technical infrastructure, what are your core services and then what's your value add that you can then add on to make a difference. So let's have a look at some of the in industries that experienced that. Laurie's already said IBM, 1993, 1994, I think it was four point something billion. It was in debt. Not many companies come back from the losses of four point something billion. You know, that's huge losses. They completely turned the company around, making it almost completely focused on services. They're the case study. Um, you know, Lou Gerstner has written lots of books on how he did it. But now we have Microsoft now selling Office 365, which I'm sure you're all aware of. So now instead of you actually having to get the disk or download the disk, actually now you've actually got Office 365, literally as it says, online. Which I have to say is quite interesting because I guess this is when you tell if you're getting old or not, is I started in the airline industry a few years ago. And we had a thing called dumb terminals, which is basically where if you want to make an airline reservation, you went British Airways select and it routed you through to that airline's computer and you talked to it. And then if you decided you wanted to go and talk to Virgin, you went Virgin select and off it shot there. The terminal on your desk actually wasn't doing anything and it was all just basically being sent back. And here we are now, 30 years later, and I feel like we're talking about the same thing, which is basically it's just sending it back. I just say PowerPoint select or word select. But there we go. So, you know, those are the obvious people. But what about Boeing? What about Boeing and their new 787 Dreamliners? Boeing sell aircraft. So what they do, they're an engineering company. It's what Laurie said. They're an engineering company that engineer aircraft. A lot of problems engineering that aircraft to get it off the ground, but that's what they do. When you buy a Boeing 787, if you happen to have a few hundred million you're lying around, you know, you know, one of you might be doing this, so you might need to know this. It doesn't just come with an aircraft. They don't just deliver it to the airline now. It has to come with a complete data link to Boeing's data centers. And Boeing's data centers have got all the software on it for the complete maintenance of them. So when you buy it, you're buying, you have to buy their maintenance service. You can't go and maintain that anywhere else. It's a bit like buying a car nowadays and having, you know, you lift up the hood. When I was a kid, you lifted up the hood and you had to fix it because I couldn't afford not to. You know, and we twiddle with it. And Steph used to have a beach buggy, I seem to remember, that we were forever <laughs> twiddling with. Nowadays, you plug it up to a laptop. A 787 Dreamliner is exactly the same. They absolutely, and it's all connected. So now, not only are they selling that, but they're selling LAN connectivity, Wi-Fi enablement, hardware on board. They're selling data center space. They're selling hosting applications the are the full works. So that's where it's coming from. The last one, Rolls-Royce. It's another thought. The engine's on a 787. Rolls-Royce don't sell aircraft engines anymore. So what they're actually now doing is part of lorries move to services. They've moved to services. They still supply you an engine. You know, it'd be a bit embarrassing if you didn't have one, wouldn't it, really? But they don't actually sell you the engine. You don't buy the engine. What you do is you pay them per mile. So now what they're doing is you basically, depending on how many miles you do, that's what you pay them. So they're actually almost renting it to you. They're renting an engine, but they're selling it to you as a complete service wrap, which is what we're going to come on and look at of how they've done that and what does that mean. And so there's lots of other industries that are doing this as well. So we're going to look at those. Um, a little case study just to make it real. Interroot, probably a company, you've, anybody heard of Interroot? 
Roland Fasker, Ben and Steph Fasker's I told them that. <laughs> um, Interu, fascinating company, um, privately owned, operates a huge next generation network. Um, they've got, um, basically they're covering the whole of Europe, Middle East and Africa in about 99, 2000, when it was all the rage, they basically dug a lot of fibre into the ground. They dug it 60,000 kilometres worth of fibre all round, basically major areas. They went all over Europe. They created this whole network. So they've got a great technical infrastructure. Um, what they then did was try and sell that to wholesalers. They are the fifth largest ISP in Europe. Okay, and no, none of you have heard of them. That's because they aggregate up all the ISP traffic and most of it is carried on their network. So this is where they come from. So they're the unseen carriers of things. What they were doing is that they then looked at that and went, well, we're now in this wholesale price. What happens to Laurie's model is we just now get squeezed because you've got level three out there. You've got time global crossing. They've all got fiber everywhere, BT. We're now in trouble because all that's happening is we're now moving into that commodity place. We're now going to get commoditized on this and it's going to be cheapest price wins and that's not a place anybody wants to be. So they changed. What they did is they segmented up the market and said, well, who else could we sell this to? And they started looking at corporates, large corporates. Can we create virtual private networks and use this network for large corporates that have got a footprint across Europe? that we can then start linking them together in a private network for them. And we can create a private network for them, inherently secure because it doesn't go anywhere else. This is it. And once they buy it, actually traffic on the network is free. So great proposition for them. And between 2004 and 2008, basically, they grew the business by sort of 67%, um, which is great. And, you know, they quadrupled it, EBITDA quadrupled it. It was all fantastic. Um, that was all great, and of course, in telecoms, with the 2000, as Laurie said, 2000, I was at Ericsson, and the gates came down. I think it's me. 2008, I joined Interim. And it felt like a bit like the gates came down. But it didn't, because we started again developing the service business for them. And t last year's revenues, they still grew by 12%. So everything's supposed to be in decline. We're supposed to be in recession. This company's still grown by 12%. It's now got... Um, 410 million is its turnover, so it's not a small company. Profits 140% up on the year before in 2011. It's not bad. I wouldn't mind it. I'd, I'd, I'd have a percentage. So what did they do? How did they achieve this? So putting this onto our model, they've got the technical infrastructure, which is their 60,000 of lit fibre. Their core services, what they've got is they've got a number of data centres. They've got a number of hosting centres. They've got 10 centres that they own, must get this right, 31 co-location centres. Um, does everybody know what a co-location centre is? A few knows. Co-location is where data centre is where the company actually creates a data centre, puts all the servers in, puts all the fire blades, etc. in, and then you come and put your software onto them. The company owns them. Co-location space is where they own the building, so they'll create a space like this. They'll put all the infrastructure in, so they'll put all the fire suppression, the air conditioning, you know, the, the backup power supplies, all that sort of thing, and provide that service for you. But you can physically come in and put your hardware into it. You can basically come in, plug it in, and then normally in most co-location centres, other network providers will also be there. So you don't have to be locked into one network provider to then get your stuff out, connect to it. Um, and they've got about 140 other third-party providers. What they've now done is they've now added a new added value service. And in March, they launched the Interu Virtual Data Center. New product, basically offering a virtual data center product. They're offering this as a complete service that's obviously virtual. <laughs> you know, they're not using just sort of VMware, but they are doing other things with it. They've created this whole virtual data center it's on net, so it's on their network, so you can get anywhere to it. You get security, you get speed, you get, um, you know, basically as much space as you want, so you can actually go and load applications on it. 
and you can basically get hold of those applications anywhere in the globe at incredible speeds. But they are selling that as a service. They haven't sold any product. They haven't sold data center space, they haven't sold a network connection, they haven't sold all the various components. They've just, they're just selling that as virtual data center, VDC. That's what you're buying. And you're buying an amount of space, you're, and that's what you buy. But with it, you get all the rest of it. So you get all the break and fix services, you get all the fire suppression, you get all the maintenance, you get the 24 by seven, you get the backups, you get all that as part of the proposition. So the hub is all there, but this one's being sold as a complete service. Okay. What else have we got? And Laurie mentioned about Philips. Just a quick thing about Philips, because I found this fascinating, to be honest with you, because I'd worked in the telecoms industry and the IT industry. We were leading the way, and we came up with something clever. And then we had a conversation with Philips Lighting. And they were doing exactly the same thing, basically. Um, in telecoms, we had this really fantastic model for services, which was, goes around PDIM. Plan services, design services, implement services, and manage services. So basically, if you've got a product, then you will, help, you will do services to help them plan it, like your software. You know, your, your box you sold, you, know, you might have services around how they, they can plan to use it. Um, you can help them design how they want it to look. You might sell them that service. You might sell them how to implement it. You know, I'll come and install it for you or I'll manage it once it's broken and I'll come and fix it for you, type services. And this company is doing exactly the same. They are following that exact same model with lighting. The reason being is they've suddenly realized that all these lovely fluorescent tubes are all moving over to long life bulbs. LEDs are coming in, they've got 50 year lifespans. All of a sudden this lovely product is suddenly got a lifespan to it. It's suddenly got no longevity to it. All of a sudden, overnight, what they thought was great is now not looking so clever. So as Laurie said, they can move either to squeeze the product price or they can look to move to services. And no doubt they're probably looking at both, but one of the things they are looking at doing is doing a product service strategy where they're looking to run city centres. They're offering to run buildings. They're offering to run um, you know, with a network, basically like a network operation centre. So they will sit there and monitor what's going on with your lighting and fix it. All services that they're basically offering. So it's coming in in a lot of places. So how do you do it? How do you go about this? As a company, you have a number of service directions that you can take. And we can plot those around these two axes. Which is basically, as a customer, you can have the customer manages it, or you manage it on that spectrum. And you can also decide if the customer owns the product or you own the product. So if you think about Rolls-Royce engines, you can sort of start plotting where they think they are. You know, they're managing it and they own it, basically. That's where they've gone. Okay. But you don't have to go there. There are options. You know, you don't have to jump into one of these boxes. So the first option is you can come down to this service box and you can offer a service portfolio where basically the customers manage it, customer owns your, your equipment, and the customer's basically managing it, they're running it. So this is your very simple break and fix services. This is your, you know, if it goes wrong, I'll come and fix it type guarantees. You know, sort of very simple services, but they add value. They add something different to the customer. But you can move to the other end of the spectrum and you can start adding where the customer still owns the, the equipment, but you might start managing it for them. So, for example, one of the things you might want to do is put in some... Oh, I've got a software box. You could offer them that actually I can set up some telemetry systems on it and I can monitor that. When you're asleep, out of hours, I can have that monitored for you so you know that that server or this software package or this piece of equipment is, is running the way it should. So while you're asleep and not managing it and all your team have cleared off, we'll do that bit for you because that's the expensive bit because we actually work one third of the day, two thirds of the day, nobody's looking after this stuff. So there's a great opportunity there to move into that box. So you're managing on behalf of the customer. So maybe that's the services that you want to start, you could consider offering. I put this one on there because everybody, I thought everybody's gonna ask me about this one. Outsourcing, the dreaded word outsourcing. Um, this is basically where companies will outsource 
a department or a complete function out. To be honest with you, very few companies do it, very few companies can well, you know, it is something very specialist. It's probably not something you really want to go. It comes with huge implications of 2P, all sorts of things. Um, if you start going on there, you say contract stuff. Well, if you start moving to this one, you really do get into some nightmares. So probably, maybe not somewhere most of us want to go. But it is there on the, on, on the picture. Another option that you might like to look at and consider for your, your business is where actually you take your product and you lease and rent it and then you wrap services around it. So in this model, for example, um, Rolls-Royce, they are leasing and renting basically their engines. That's what they're doing. And then they're wrapping a maintenance service around it. They're wrapping a service so that if you want spare parts for it, then when, when the aircraft lands and the old engineer comes up to it and gives it a bit of doot doot doot, oh, I need a, I need a, a six, six inch widget for this, this airplane they do a spare parts management service so they will actually then courier out or whatever the spare part or they'll hold spare parts at various places that's the service offering that they're doing so that might be something you want to consider finally the big one this is where you start moving into the managed services or as a service piece that we come on to. and this is the piece where we're talking about it's basically um, you're no longer physically selling the product this is where you're moving into it's a service sale so yes they are getting yeah the hardware but a bit like our Cathay Pacific they are now getting the hardware they're getting the software they're getting the full yeah, they're getting everything basically and they're paying you a fixed amount per month and that is a lovely place to be when I was at Ericsson my managing director at the time had a goal that he wanted to get to on the 1st of January to have 100% of his operational costs covered on the 1st of January. So all his growth then came onwards, you know, because it was known service revenues. He knew each month he was going to get that money. He was on five-year contracts. They're normally over that sort of time. Um, and it's great. You know, you can do great growth things. You can, op you can operate a thing called tariff book where when you sign the contract, you can say to your customers, but if you want to then develop it, grow it, these are the costs that it will cost you to grow it. And it, just, and it does work very well. So it's a great way of doing it. What you do is you end up with the original contract, and then basically you can just have additions to it so the contract grows. And if you do your services right, and you actually work with customers and they like your service, then they would put more with you, the contract value grows and grows. And it is just quite incredible where it can go. Um, it does come with a warning. I must give this warning. Um, to, to move into these services, so most, 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 I guess, will be, you know, down here maybe, maybe some of you here, but certainly most companies nowadays are doing sort of break and fix services. If you're looking for a strategy to start thinking, well, actually, could we move here or could we move here, you won't be able to move there unless that core service that is is correct you know it is up to that industry part it is delivering what it says it's going to do if they've bought the, your box off you and it goes wrong and you can't fix it they're not going to trust you to run it for them you know they're not going to trust you they're just going to go you're right okay that's you know good luck with that we'll, we'll we'll carry on looking after it ourselves i think you know so you do need to make sure that if you are moving into services you've got to have those basic services that people expect right before you can start moving up into these different service directions. So I just thought I ought to mention that very quickly. Okay, so that's our service, that's our strategy directions that we can take, how you can develop it. Let's use Rolls-Royce and their engines. If you suddenly move into that, you have now got to basically offer a spare parts management service. So that sounds great but then you're into processes. How do you make sure you've got spare stores on site? How do you know they're gonna be repaired? When, when a faulty part comes off, how do you know when it's gone off to be repaired, it's come back, it's gone back into inventory, it's now where it should be? There's a lot of questions about when you do this. So there is a lot of things, there is a big business impact to be looked at, you know, that needs to be considered. And we'd urge you to do it before you rush off and start putting it together. Then once you've done that, then there is obviously the product development stages. After that, it's a service. You might have break and fix services around your product. You might have you know, more you know, 
we'll look after it after hours for these type of services, or you might say, actually, it's all a service, we'll run it for you. Whatever it is, you've got to design the customer experience. Services are intangible, and we're dealing with human beings, and things go wrong, and all the rest of it, and we need to design what that customer experience is. How, as, a, as the customer, is it going to work? So when the guy turns up at Rolls-Royce and the engineer's standing there on the tarmac with a plane full of people, you know, what's his experience? You know, that sort of thinking. I know we're skirting through this really quickly, but there's an awful lot to it, but just wanted to give you a flavour of things to consider. Once you've done that, if you're in bigger companies, then you want to start giving your guys sales toolkits to go out and sell this. They're no longer selling a widget, you know. I want to sell this iPad, it's very easy, really. I can give you that and say, oh, please play with that. If you're selling as a service, you haven't got something. So as marketers, we need to start creating toolkits to make it feel tangible, to make it feel real for them, to feel that experience, to make them want to buy it. And then we have to launch it. We have to tell people. And we need to tell people inside the company as well as outside the company. I've seen so many products that have been launched by marketing that, that the operations teams or the IT teams didn't even know was going out there. And they're going, are we? Have we? Oh, that's nice. What are we doing then? The first thing you know about it is the phone call to the help desk who goes, um, I've just got this upgrade and, you know, away you go. I'm sure you know the story. Okay, so we're going to have a few minutes just looking at then how do you develop this proposition. Yeah, we're almost there. Um, so how do you then go about actually creating this whole proposition? And what you do is basically you look at what the actual product is. What oh, message dropped off. Um, so you'd look at what are the features of the product, so what is it, um, then you'd look at what the augmented features are of that, and then you'd look at the emotional features about it. So if we put this into a car term, then basically the core product is a car, the augmented features is, um, you know, it's got wheels, it's got a steering wheel, it's got, um, you know, seats, it's got a boot, you know, all those sort of things you'd hope the car came with. We then put a number of emotional features when we've designed our car. So we put a, an iPod plug, because we will want one of those now, and um, you know, a sat-nav that can tell us and get, tell us to get lost or whatever. So that's our product. We've developed our product, normally done by an engineering team. So uh, but we'll try and pull that all together. We then add our value-added services. So we then decide we're going to put in what our services are to that mix. And we decide what they are. And um, with that, you might add in insurance, you might add in um, breakdown cover, you might add in uh, car tax, etc. These sort of services. And you put in your full added value services. Once you've got that as a package, you then start looking at it and saying, OK, what are the key? We've got all these features. What are the benefits of it? That's what sells. You know, and there's the key word, which means that. So if ever you're trying to get from all this lovely product and services, actually, I now need to sell this and convey it. You want to sell its benefits. We don't buy products. You know, we don't buy, you know, 16 gig or something. Like 16 gig of RAM. You know, we buy, I can, I can do an iPhone. I can, I can now record myself. That's the capability we sell. So we create those key benefits of what they are. Then you want to distill that benefit into a single proposition to your customers so that the customers then can understand the proposition. So our proposition in all of this is basically just add fuel. Okay, So that's our simple proposition that we've come up with that's our single thing out to the marketplace. And that's what Peugeot have done. So Peugeot's new adverts are just add fuel. And what they've done is do exactly that <coughs> with a car. And that's all you now need to do. You can just go into Peugeot, pay them £200 a month, and just have fuel. Everything else is taken care of for you. And that's because they've taken the product, they've taken the hardware, and they've taken the services, they've put it together and given you a proposition. Okay. Okay. Um, I just thought we ought to sort of have it in a bit of cloud computing really, but it's a very similar thing with cloud computing. It's exactly the same thing, what you've done with infrastructure as a service, platforms as a service, applications as a service. They're up in that top box. You're not selling the hardware anymore. The proposition is, you know, you're selling the service wrap around it. 
So really with cloud computing, you know, the networks and servers are your technical, you know, technical infrastructure. You've got your application layer, which is your core services, and then you've got your added values on top of that. So it just fits with that. Um, and then finally, I, I thought I'd put that up because I sort of thought everything we talked about was a little bit, that's great if I'm a big company, if I'm Rolls Royce or I'm Peugeot, but what happens if it's just me? So, um, you know, and I've got my friend who's written his um, computer software program and, you know, he's, he's got made redundant, um, decided he fancied getting into programming again. He'd gone into different areas of IT, but actually wanted to get into programming. Got into that and wanted to get his skills back. And at the time, you know, his brother said, I've got a real requirement over here. I need something done. I've been looking around. Can you build me something? And he's gone, that's just for me. So he sets up his little company and off he goes. Full of enthusiasm, 80% later, I'm like to say this is where you were, but 80% later, normally you get 80% there. The last 15% is a nightmare, and the last 5% is which you just want to kill yourself and probably never ever get done. So, you know, I guess that's why Microsoft still doesn't work to this day. Um, so we get to this situation where we've got this product. We now have a bit of a problem. We've got this lovely product. We've, got, we've sold it once. Now what are we going to do? And what we can start thinking about is then, is how do you start adding those services to that product? So instead of just trying to give away its products, because most people nowadays download an app, well, I'd like first at least a trial version free. Um, software, a lot of it's free. You know, people are looking for downloads of it. If you can sell it, normally very, very, you know, people aren't looking. You know, Apple, thankfully, have now driven everybody down to think that everything costs pennies. You know, they, everything, you know, should be 169p or 199. You know, if anything's on there for 20 quid, you're thinking, oh, hold on a minute, how much? I remember when Microsoft Office was about, you know, two, three hundred pounds for a software package. You know, so things have changed. So you need to start thinking then, if you're in that position, <coughs> excuse me, how you can use these services and what we've talked about tonight. How can you start adding consultancy wraps around it? How can you add break and fix around it? Can you actually go and sell what your program's there to deliver, but as a service? So don't actually sell the capability to the company. Don't give them the product. Go and sell them and say, I can give you the capability to deliver this um, you know, tool, this, this product, this software package, but it'll help you do things. You know, um, you know, if you're looking to deliver, think of an example. Um, you're looking to ISO 9001. So you're into 9, can we, we need to deliver a 9001. Can you put some software in that will help actually control and constrain our processes? Yes, I've got a program that can do that. But I could sell you that for a pound or 30 quid or whatever. That's your sale gone. Or I can come in, I can help you implement it, I can manage it, I can run it, I can give you upgrades on it. You know, I can actually uh, host it on a data centre and on the Interroots data centre and you'll never see it and your guys just call it up and actually that's going to cost you £10 a month. You've now got £10 a month every month coming in for that length of contract. That's really what we're trying to talk about tonight. Okay. I'll now hand over to Laurie because I've taken more than enough time as we expected but Laurie's just going to talk to you now about thought leadership which is subject of his new book which is really okay you've got all this now how do you create that thought leadership position in the marketplace to really get people to come on board what you're talking about. Hand over to you. Oh, sorry. Don't go. Are there any comments or questions on what Tony said first before we Yes. But if you're selling um, service space, once you've got beyond the physical, of we've got this wonderful data set to look at the picture and the machine guns and toolboxes and stuff. <laughs> yes. It's commodity. So you're then back into the picture at the beginning of down to the price. If you just position it as that product. When we're selling um, services, when I'm selling data centers with Interroat, 
we didn't sell it as data center space. You know, if you wanted that co-location space, yes, you could have that. But we started selling it as unified computing. And so we branded it up and gave it a different name. And then you started adding in the added value services to it. So yes, you can just go down that route, but you can then look to see how can you differentiate yourself and add value to the things you're offering. Else can do the same thing. It's how, yes. It's no, and to be honest with you, you know, a lot of things that we're talking about, have, you know, I mean, data centers, this rack space, do, you can get a data center from rack space for tuppence halfpenny. Interroot doesn't charge rack space prices. They are 10 times the price. They don't get 140% profit margins by trying to get the same price as rack space does. They offer a completely different service. The end product is exactly the same. It is basically server space. It's what they're selling. That's what they're selling. They, they come up with that proposition. It's how you build that whole proposition around it and to create the value that's the difference and what you put in there to make you different. So it doesn't come down to just a price play. Sorry. Yes, Ron. Going, going back to your, that feeds into question I had the service direction slide up. Yes. My impression was as a, as a somebody starting out, Yes. The bottom left hand corner, which is customer managed, customer owned. Yes. Is actually the cheapest entry has market the cheapest entry point. Yes. Getting into the top right hand corner is has the highest entry point because you A you've got the cost of providing a product and wrapping it, but B you're you're selling it as a service like Rolls Royce pound per mile or whatever. So you actually your your risk level and your capital tied up is actually much greater. Yeah, so potentially. 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 Yes. 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 Absolutely. There's a couple of little tricks around that little gem. If you're a small software company and you're the small end of the marketplace and you've basically already written off your costs to produce it, then actually the cost of your product, which is the high cost of entry that you're talking about, is actually already taken care of. So you don't need to worry about that. If you're higher end and you've got a physical you know you're trying to sell quite a, an expensive piece of kit that basically has a big upfront investment for you that you want to then amortize out and sell monthly what you tend to do then is you can go and find a leasing company and back it off with a leasing company so you would then do a five-year contract with them to buy the kit so that's your expense put put to the side and you've got a service contract with additional revenues on top of that call rental that will pay for it. So that's the way around it. But you are right, you have to look at what the product is. You know, yes, Rolls Royce, it's going to cost them a lot of money to build an engine. They have to decide that they can carry that cost. And normally, on those sort of deals, you would look to make sure that over that five year period, it basically paid back in about three years. And your last two years were bonus. And then at the end of the five years, you would then sell the equipment your software package or whatever to the customer for a peppercorn, you know, a pound or whatever. Or you sell them an upgrade package and say, well, actually, as we're all here, we can upgrade that and we can do it at reduced price because now you've got their attention, you can upgrade it, you're integrated into their systems, their everything, and you can offer it much cheaper than all the competitors because you've had two years of profit, thank you very much, come up to that. So you can now undercut your competitors, offer better service, and everybody's happy. Or, you know, so there's different, sorry, there's just different options basically of what you can do. But yeah, you are right. There is, there is potential. That, and that's, that's why I was saying to you, when you do this, you have to think about the business impact of what you're doing. It isn't something you can just go, I want to go there. You know, it has to be considered first. A perfect example yes. of airlines, they don't own their aircraft most of the time. No. They lease them. Yeah. You go in front of a Virgin plane, I've seen the little plate up there that says who's the leasing company. Yes. Who owns the plane. Yeah. They never that funds in there, that's way too much money. Yeah. Someone else should take that, I'll get the money because they're yeah. able to lend money. Yeah, like, you know, leasing companies, all sorts of ways of doing it and funding it. So, yeah, a lot of things going on. Is there anything else before? No? Uh, You're okay? We're around a bit afterwards, so I'll let you do a bit on you. thought leadership. Stefan said we ought to be... Um, dear, oh dear. I've also got a bigger head than you. Stefan, Stefan said we ought to be wrapping up now, so we, we don't want to go on too much longer. Uh, ten, minutes. ten minutes, yeah. So I just, just need to, 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 to finish with, with two things. Firstly,
Don't underestimate human beings' desire to experience things, to enjoy services, and how valuable that is. Um, you know, just because it's not a physical product, um, you know, people do buy into these things. I, I don't know whether has anybody been to the ice bar in um, in, in London? What was it like? What did you experience? Very, very interesting. It's very good. I've been there twice. You've been there twice. They change over the year to line every six months. They, they do, don't they? Does everybody know what this is? It's run by. Is it Smirnoff or is it Absolute, Absolute Vodka? All right. And um, you you go. Uh, it's near Oxford Street, isn't it? Off Regent Street, round the, round there. And um, you go there, and it, you, you you have to book in advance, don't you? Oh, is it cheaper? Doing it? Yeah, oh, lovely. And and you, you, right? Okay. So so it's a it's an experience people go to, and you, you go for what is it? Thirty minutes? Forty minutes? Uh, oh, really? Okay. So you go a little bit like lovely. Um, so what this is 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 a a metal room where they build a bar out of ice that is shipped in from Vladivostok. I seem to remember. So it's very, very cold, and you stand around literally a, a bar made of ice, and your your beakers are made of ice too, aren't they? They're the same same thing. Yes, you you. You you are, aren't you? You put on these big mittens, aren't they? And, uh, so so you go with your your loved one, and they make a point of making you look ugly, all right. <laughs> So, uh, isn't that true? Uh, and you're only there for 30 minutes, and you get one shot of vodka. Is that, is one shot and one glass for free. If you're, if you're an experienced caterer, then you quickly cut down the exercise you want. You know. Right. Now, here's the, here's the question. In London right now, what does a, cost, what, what does a bottle of absolute vodka cost? Uh, it's, about uh, it's about 18 quid. Well, how long does it... How, how much do you pay... To go and stand in the cold, look ugly, and have one small shot of vodka. Last time I went, it was 12 quid during the week and 15 during a Saturday. Yeah. So 15 quid on a Saturday. So, so just, just take this in for a minute. This, this company that makes vodka, there's nothing more producty than a, than, than, it's a product, isn't it? What they've done is they've created a service experience that people on a Friday and a Saturday night really queue up to go to. It's hard to get in. Um, they make you cold, they make you look ugly, you can only stand there for half an hour, and people pay just under what it would cost if they went out round the corner and bought a whole bottle of vodka. This is ridiculous. It shouldn't make sense. It's not logical. But that's what human beings do. And, and if you want a... That's a consumer example. If, you, if, you, if you're thinking, I only serve businesses, think of a company like McKinsey, the... Um, the consultancy company. Now, all they've got is intelligent, clever people. And to be honest, most of them join as children. You know, they leave university. They've never done a real job. Bless them. You know, they've they got very sharp brains and they, got, they work really hard. Um, they're trained extensively, but they run around telling other business people, very, very senior people, what to do. <laughs> You know, that, that's what they do. Um, and, and you tell them what to do that they already knew what they wanted to do already. Exactly. Often, you, yeah, they're just reconfirming what they said. But they're very, very bright. Um, and, and as you say, the, 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 it's that... IBM, I seem to remember, years ago, ran, a, ran a, an advertising campaign saying nobody ever got fired for buying IBM. And it's the same effect, isn't it? You know, people, senior people often use a, a company like McKinsey to justify what they're doing. Um, but just to give you a, an indication of the power of the McKinsey experience, their worldwide revenues are about seven billion American dollars. Right? They they company. So if they're doing well, HSBC want about 9-10% on their retail bank. Tesco's target net margin, net margin, if they're doing well, is around about 7-11%. McKinsey's net margin on its $7 billion is in excess of 60%. Now, all it is is a service experience. That's all it is. But they've created... Sorry? 
isn't it? It, yeah, it, it, it's, it's something vague and magical, but, but serious, intelligent, experienced business people buy into this. So this idea of creating a unique service experience works in both consumer uh, with the ice bar and it works in business to business with, with companies like McKinsey. And I would argue Goldman Sachs, Deloitte. And the magic is that you can do it, as, a, as Tony says, if you're a small company too. Uh, and we just wanted to close by pointing out that um, as companies are moving into this cloud computing service environment, almost every single one of them is using a technique to communicate what they're doing called thought leadership. Has people, have people come across that term? Sorry? All <laughs> oh, right, okay. You, you have come across it. It's, it's very common. I, IBM use it, Fujitsu use it. What's fascinating is that some companies like IBM, Deloitte if you know them, the big consultancy company, they spend as much on that as some consumer product companies spend on advertising. I, I came across one budget um, uh, recently because I've been studying the book, I can't tell you who it is, but they spend every year over 200 million American dollars on this thing called thought leadership. It's the communication of an idea. What's magical is you and I can do it too. It's a way of communicating a service because if you're um, at a marketing a product, say this product here, if I'm doing that, I can, I can show you it in leaflets, I can put it on television, I can, I can let you trial it. It's, it's physical, but with a service, there's nothing at all. And what seems to be happening is, is, is the way of communicating a service is through this technique called thought leadership, creating ideas. So if you go onto the websites of um, many, many uh, companies like IBM, Deloitte, whatever, and look at their thought leadership, you'll see uh, reports, research surveys, um, presentations that they've created around an idea. So IBM's big idea is innovation for a small planet um, uh, and, um, uh, and others there. So I just want to close by, by telling a story of somebody who did that before that gives me sort of hope and uh, um, and I'm going right back to the 1700s again in the start of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, there was a man called Matthew Bolton. Has anybody ever heard of Matthew Bolton? Fabulous man, lived, lived in Birmingham. Remarkable man, yes? He, he, he created a little business selling silver trinkets. This was in around about 1760. And he made a lot of money. He was very clever. He, he did the sort of things that, that they would talk to do in marketing, you know, create leaflets, have salespeople, and he became very, very successful. He joined a group of net, a network like this, uh, and it was called the Lunar Society. Now, that sounds very odd and strange, but they called it the Lunar Society because they would meet um, every, once a month on the full moon, um, and they drank late into the night arguing, as people tend to, and there was no street lights. They needed to find their way home on a, on a horse, drunk. Um, so they called it the Lunar Society. They only met on the full moon. They were very practical business people. Josiah Wedgwood joined it and others. Um, but Matthew Bolton came across a, an engineer called James Watt. And James Watt, uh, as you know, uh, created an adaptation to the steam engine. Lots of school children are taught that he invented it. He didn't. Um, as I understand it, the very first design of a steam engine was by a guy called Hero of Mesopotamia in AD 40. So people knew what a steam engine was. Uh, they saw a demo at the Royal Society in the late 1600s. So they were, they, were, they, were, they were being used. In fact, Matthew Bolton and Josiah Wedgwood had manufacturing lines powered by steam uh, before Watt came up with his thing. But what they did was something very clever. Matthew Bolton realized there was money and opportunity in this thing. I mean, it was just two people. Uh, so what he did is he got his, his engineer working away on the design. They broke the market down into segments. They went for the uh, uh, miners in Cornwall, and they said to them, you know, if, 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 you, if you adopt our steam engine, uh, you'll get to greater depths because it'll pump the water out. So we'll take a percentage of the inc incremental revenue realized. Uh, in brewing, Whitbread were open, opening their brewery in London and they used what we would call celebrity marketing because they got the king to open it with great uh, fanfare. 
to one uh, uh, buyer in France, they gave the steam engine free uh, on, uh, on condition that he would tell everybody about it. So he got a free trial on condition that he told all his friends uh, about the power of this thing. But what they did, what was really, really smart, Matthew Bolton got, got several of his friends, uh, uh, Charles Darwin's grandfather and various others who were in the Lunar Society, to join the scientific institution, the Royal Society. Uh, and I sat in their library and seen some of the books of what they were doing at the time. What's fascinating is it was just like blogging. At the time, scientists um, who were wealthy would write in, who were members of the Royal Society, would write in uh, in a particular format and their blog, it was a very short brief thing on the progress of their, of their experiments, were read into the record. And Matthew Bolton got um, his friends who joined the Royal Society writing in about James Watt's experiments. All right. He got them <coughs> blogging in there. Um, one, uh, he also um, uh, got them to uh, write about the thought of the power of steam uh, in, in publications like the Birmingham Gazette. And one historian says that this impartial report <laughs> Uh, had Matthew Bolton's round marketing phrases running all the way through it. They communicated the power of the idea um, and it, it was so powerful that by the time they released James Watt's adaptation, 30% of British industry had delayed replacing their existing machines and it went out to a completely new market. These were just two people with an idea starting a technology company with a product wrapped with a service and product combined. And I would commend to you this, um, if you want to go down this route and you want to exploit the power of, 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 of the cloud and do this um, mixture of product services and, and uh, uh, software that Tony has been talking about, I would commend to you uh, this technique of thought leadership. It could make you a fortune. Stefan. We've, we've finished. I don't know whether... Any questions? <coughs> Question. Uh, fantastic. Normally, we tell the speakers to go quicker. And, uh, <laughs> you, you've got about 10 minutes, so if there are any questions, please uh, use the opportunity to ask uh, both Tony and uh, Laurie. Or here they go. Well, 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 Feel free. Instead of mantra, the customer is king, are we now saying the customer is stupid? <coughs> same product with your bundle of services which ties them in so they can't look around and get them. Yes. You're making a profit, so that's fine. Yes. So that's great. But the customer, they're being ripped off. Can, can I let you in on a, on a marketing secret? If you, don't tell anyone. <laughs> what, one of the things that marketing people have known for a long time is you never, ever, under any circumstances, give customers what they want. That's not how you make money. Um, I think it was Henry Ford that said, if, if I'd asked my customers what they wanted, they'd have asked for faster horses. Yes. Um, uh, and very often customers can't, people, human beings can't imagine, what, you know, the power of what you can do for them. Um, so, the tr I mean, nobody was sitting on a beach um, in 1880 saying, I'm really thirsty. If only I had a black drink full of sugar that would rot my teeth. And yet Coca-Cola became the marketing phenomenon of the 20th century. You know, once it was put in front of them, people said, oh, I like that. And, and, and if, you want, if you want a modern example, Steve Jobs, <laughs> Steve Jobs said, people don't know what they want, you know, and he drove that company to come up with the iPhone, the iPad, and all that, all that sort of stuff. So, so you know, pe pe when, when human beings see something, they say, that, that's for me. And, and actually, it's really powerful if you, if you can get a sort of herd effect. You know, everybody like Apple, they all want to be in on, 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 the, on the thing. But you don't make money by asking customers what they want. Because they normally say, I'd like more of the same and I want it cheaper. And if you provide that, you'll go out of business. Um, so I, I don't think that's flippant. I think that's a really important principle. Uh, any other comments or questions? Well, I hope it's been really useful. Um, industry around the world is moving into this thing called cloud and creating value out of services is a really important engineering job in various parts of the world right now. And uh, 
I would commend it to you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Tony. Thank you. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That's very kind. Hope you enjoy it. <laughs> and, uh, and also, uh, we do, Thank when you. speakers select a book from our bookshop, we do present it. And I think, uh, Laurie, you are going to uh, choose yours and we will dispatch yes. it to you. And Tony. Thank you. That was what oh, you were after. Thank you. Uh, fantastic. And uh, just before we close, uh, Nick is going to be at. Uh, uh, Hill Hempstead at Steria on uh, Thursday the 16th of May and it's uh, the use of NLP or Neuro Linguistic Programming and how that can help ICT practitioners. Again it's going to be a dual act and there are uh, a couple of people who are actually going to come to, to the presentation so look forward to seeing all of you there. Uh, safe journey home. Thank you. Sorry just oh. Just one quick thing, I did forget, is right at the end of the last slide, there is a website from Products to Services, it's amazingly put, and there's a lot more information. We've really scoused over this today, so there is an awful lot more in there. It's a membership website, but it is all free. Um, so please, obviously it'll come out with the packs, but if you want to know more, all the information, there's a lot more information on there available for you. Okay, thank you. Sorry to interrupt the back.